Welcome back to Cemetery Confessions. Before we jump into today's episode, I just have a quick announcement. We recently added two new podcasts to the Belfry Network that I think you would enjoy, so I thought it would be worth mentioning. The first is Rose Sinister Vampires. Rose Sinister is a New Orleans vampire tour guide, and her new podcast is all about the shows, t- uh, movies, and books that we all love so much, except she doesn't just review the content. She doesn't just talk about the composition and the the way they were edited and how they made her feel, but it's a deep dive into the philosophical, political, and social uh, climate and content of this media. Uh, the first episode I listened to was Underworld, and she started talking about Marxist hegemonies, and I knew that this was going to be something special, something I would want to listen to. The other podcast we recently added to the network is the Cat vs. Bat podcast, this is run by two long-term, long-time Toronto DJs in the goth industrial scene. It's a show where they sit around and talk about and share stories from their careers and from their lives and talk about some of the music that has been meaningful to them recently and in the past as well as play some of it. But it's not a typical DJ mix show. Each song is linked to a story and linked to something meaningful for them. It really fills an interesting spot within the sort of Belfry Network pantheon. So if you would like to check out those shows, you can go to their individual RSS feeds or you can subscribe to the Belfry Network where you can also get Cemetery Confessions and all the other podcasts, of course, that are on. And finally, if you enjoy the podcast and you want to support us, help keep us on the air, or get some bonus content like early episode releases, monthly live streams, exclusive merchandise, and access to our Discord server with our community of like-minded people, among a bunch of other stuff, please head over to patreon.com slash cemeteryconfessions. This show only continues to exist because of people who have decided to support us. You can sign up at just $1 a month, which is hopefully something everyone can afford. So thank you so much for your support. Let's get into today's episode. You are listening to Cemetery Confessions, the world's number one goth talk podcast. All right, hello and welcome back to Cemetery Confessions. This month, we are going to be taking a look at those elusive and liminal cultural groupings that have become sort of tangential to goth genres like witch house, synth wave, uh, cultural affiliations like new goth, pastel goth, that kind of thing. I want to take a look at what the cultural legacy and impact that those groupings have had on the scene now that it's been about 10 years since they were have been around and whether or not they have lost that kind of subversive novelty or if they're going to be making a comeback. We've also got an album review from the band Crystal Cage, Sinister Suggestions, and more. So as always, I am The Count, and I'm here with my co-host, Mark. Hello, Mark. Hello there. And we have a very special guest this week, as always, and that is Jean-Luc. Jean-Luc is best known for being a huge fucking nerd, uh, but he also runs Post-Apocalyptic Productions, which was founded in 2008, and they put on a whole variety of events in and around Chicago. Most notably, at least for me, probably longest running is Dark Wave at Medusa's, which is a monthly goth industrial night that's kind of become a lifeline for those of us who don't live in Chicago. Uh, Jean-Luc also DJs other events in and around Chicago. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into those. And he's also, of course, a regular at uh, all the other events that are supported by the goth community. So, Jean-Luc, thanks for taking the time to hang out with us. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, we like to start with a kind of origin story to kind of get to know where you're coming from. So if you can talk a little about what your introduction to alternative or goth culture was and then why you sort of stayed with with that kind of thing for so long. 
you know, it, it's interesting because it's kind of like the the culture itself, you know, with the goth culture is so unique and mixed together with so many different genres. I just kind of came at it from a lot of different directions. My mom was really into a lot of the old school goth stuff, a lot of Susie and the Banshees, a lot of Bajas, a lot of The Cure, and things like that. And from there on in, you know, you bring in the artwork, you have the writings of that time, you have Neil Gaiman, you have The Crow, you have Dog Witch, you have a lot of things that come out graphic novel-wise. And when you have kids... They have hands and they tend to like, you know, grab onto things like albums and these graphic novels and they start seeing things and they start exploring things. And like I said earlier, the goth culture, you know, it has a lot of different variety to it. And even as you said, you know, a lot of sub genres within the whole scheme of underground scene, you know, uh, mm-hmm. you, you mentioned goth and a lot of people, you know, Robert Smith. Edward Scissorhands, that kind of thing is the first thing that like pops to, you know, to mind, you know, the the black lipstick, the dark eye shadow. But it really encompasses a lot of different things. And it, that was the thing with me, even even something like um, anime of the 80s, the vampire hunter D, the aesthetic mm, of it, yeah. you know, yeah. and that was the thing. It was the it was the aesthetic of it that really drew me in while a lot of other things like, you know, you saw heroes, I guess. The goth hero is Batman, right? Because he wears black and he hangs out with bats. It's it's totally like the goth hero. <laughs> but if Batman did not exist, who would you have to relate to? And, you know, you maybe you don't like the lighter colors. Maybe the music isn't for you. And it wasn't it wasn't necessarily a thing of I didn't feel like I belonged in those, but I felt I belonged within the goth culture and within the many different cultures within it too. And I I think that's also another thing that helped me become a DJ. Um, Mm. Not to mention my mom, you know, talking about DJs, she used to go out to clubs a lot. And uh, one of the clubs that she actually went out to funny enough about Medusa's, she went out to the old Medusa's club. I remember we, uh, we actually moved to Illinois. I was very young age and Dave Medusa came to the house. Oh shit. Yeah, my mom bought a Victorian home in Elgin, and it's Elgin has come a long way within the, uh, well, I'm going to say over the two decades I've lived here. I don't want to put that much of a date on it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's changed a lot. And she was able to snag up a good property. He was came there, you know, he was amazed by the house. It was very, you know, gothic architecture almost because of the way that it was built and you know, the darker colors that were used on it compared to yeah. what, you know, most modern homes where we have white and eggshell, you know, yeah. <laughs> here you have this dark green and red house. And, uh, you know, he promoted to her, she would go out and I'd, I'd see my mom go out and she'd be dressed up in all these things that like were straight out of the matrix nine years before the matrix even came out, you know, <laughs> like this is what the matrix was influenced by. Like somebody went to these clubs back in the day and was like, I'm going to make a movie and everyone is going to be wearing this crap. And, <laughs> you know, it it's the music that has grown with me and I've grown with it. Yeah. And the fashion, the, you know, and, and here's another thing. When you, when you talk about aesthetic and fashion, it's like, where does it end? Does it just end with your clothes, mm. your hair, the way that you carry yourself in life, your vocabulary? Like Mm -hmm. there's a lot of people like, and you don't think about this at first, but a lot of people that go ahead and get into certain things like old school poetry. And of course, when we're talking about goth culture, the first one that is the more notable, you know, poet of that culture is of course, Edgar Allan Poe. And from that, you know, you really go ahead and you find more literature that you like and then you find darker literature and then you find different uh, different things that are gothic it's it's strange because you know talking again about more variety in cultures it's like is hp lovecraft gothic i would i would have to say yes in a way gothic yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's gothic-esque you know and and the time period especially it's it's more um I wouldn't I wouldn't want to say unique than the classic horrors of like, you know, Frankenstein and 
Dracula. Yeah. And, and that's another thing. You have some of the coolest things out there like Frankenstein, Dracula, the merman, the werewolf. You know, these things that really spoke to me as a kid. I was always attracted to darker things in life and not necessarily like the more morbid things. I mean, morbid things were kind of a thing that grew on you as you grew older and you observed reality. But there was a certain charm to the silver screen darkness, you know, the, the unknown or the uh, the shadowing of what could be within the darkness. So I think mm. I think I've always been drawn to that. And I, I've got to give it to the give it to the parents on that one. And, you know. Anybody that's out there that's a goth mom or dad know that you are influencing your child probably in a very positive way. You are culturing their life. Your mom sounds fucking awesome. <laughs> she was pretty. I wish I, uh, yeah, I wish I had your mom. Yeah. <laughs> she she was and is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so okay, well you brought up you brought up your uh Dave Medusa coming, you know, to your your house for fuck's sake. Um <laughs> if if people don't know, um and probably People, a lot of people outside of Chicago don't know, but Medusa's was this kind of legendary all ages nightclub that was on, you know, up in the top of this warehouse where you had to, I think they called it the the stairway to heaven or the something, something like that, where you had to go kind of take this ritual journey through this up this spiral staircase to get up into this huge area that was um, just playing all kinds of music. They had they had actual VJs. Uh, and all this crazy nonsense, and it was it was like the best place to get those kind of imports from Europe of the the new wave and the goth and the post punk stuff that was happening at the time, which was uh, it was open from eighty three to ninety two. So Medusa's uh, on Chicago Street now is kind of the spiritual successor to that. So I'd be interested to know how you ended up getting involved with that and be, you know running the you know, goth night outside of Chicago. Now, you know, that's a really interesting thing. So to touch on a few points. Um, the old location was there pretty much at the, what I, what I really feel the end of the vinyl era. So mm. you had a lot of old talent in those spots. You even had, you know, Jeff Moyer and scary lady Sarah that, you know, were, people that would dj at the original medusas and then we go on later to create their own nights dj at neo you know such and such forward from that but then you know just like with music just like with the platforms that we use for it you know it evolved too and the the old spot ended up closing he came out to the Elgin area. He set up there. That was actually one of the reasons why he visited the home is because he was going around the area in Elgin. He was promoting to people. And he was surprised that my mom, who worked in the city and mm -hmm. would go out to the club in the city, lived in Elgin. And he was like, <laughs> what is this? You, I know you. You're a regular. You know? And usually if somebody's a regular at a club like that, you just automatically think they're in the city. So yeah. it kind of inspired him too. It was a good night. He came in, he's like, I love your house. Oh my God, this is awesome. The great no, there's there's awesome freaks out in the suburbs too, you know. Because <laughs> this was this was also a good era of the club kid, too. Yeah. The yeah. the early nineties mm. was very club kid, and that was um back when people would dress in really extravagant garb and gear and just mm. totally get kitted out and go above and beyond what they would normally just do. And this is, you know, something to really say because to, uh, to the outside viewer, when somebody is quote unquote within the goth culture, they're already dressing up. So if you can think yeah. about somebody like that dressing up, you know, you know, Halloween is just around the corner, but they're going to blow your mind every night. Hmm. Um, and it was interesting because they came out to the suburbs and at that time in the early nineties, the suburbs and not to mention social media was not as advanced within, you know, finding yeah. out about what's going on. Like yeah. back in the day, you were yeah. not going to find out about club events within the suburbs, you know, via Facebook or something like that. Like you had to look for that if you lived out here. I remember the first time when I turned eighteen, I was looking for uh, eighteen, uh, eighteen and up events in the suburbs, and I found a listing for a goth night on some 
like GeoCities website. Uh, and <laughs> I don't remember what town it was in, but I got, I was so fucking excited. I was like, okay, they're doing, they do it every other Friday. We're going this weekend. I'm going to get dressed up. So we got all ready and dressed up. Um, and then my, me and my friend. And before we left, I was like, I should call just to see, just to double check what time they open. And so I called and it ended up being some, converted into some kind of office building and they were like oh i have no idea what you're talking about we don't oh got stuff God. what it's like oh fuck that would just ruined my whole night i don't know what to do now you i know. still some i still sometimes find uh advertisements like that at places online only to find out they're like 10 years old yeah yeah i'm gonna tell you that's actually how i found neo i was looking for clubs in the chicagoland area you know i knew about nocturna i knew about a few others but i couldn't yeah. i couldn't remember this one club that my mom always used to go to and I was like, wait a minute, you know, and I was, I was like 14 and I was like, what is the yeah. name of this club? So I'm Google searching, I'm going through my AIM browser and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> looking, looking for clubs, you know, Napster's up in the background, yeah. not, not downloading Metallica, but, <laughs> and, uh, you know, Neo, and I'm like, one day I'm going to, I'm going to go to this. So I, I wrote down a bunch of addresses of clubs and by the time I was actually 21, like good 80% of those clubs had closed yeah. or the event that was going on there no longer was going on there. So it was, you know, I, I understand that disappointment. So what, when was your, like, how did you start getting involved with, did, were you just immediately a DJ and then you eventually took the night over or what? So when it comes to me becoming a DJ, so I was going to college, uh, for theatrical acting and dancing. Um, mm -hmm. I actually, uh, I, I switched my major, but I had a big pa passion for dancing. And um, when I went out to clubs after school, one of the club that I would go to all the time would be Neo, of course, because yeah. it, in my opinion, it was one of the best clubs to go for dancing. And yeah. there was certain days that you could just get that dance floor to yourself and you had great music because Jeff Moyer was there on Wednesday nights. So you'd have all the people that were there to dance on a Wednesday night and none of the traffic that you'd usually have there on a Friday mm. or Saturday. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I started to learn more music than I ever, you know, thought that I would. And I thought I knew a lot of music, but, you know, I started listening to more music and started hearing more music. And I was like, you know, why isn't this played in the club more? And I started suggesting it and suggesting it and suggesting it. And, you know, I had DJs that were really receptive and I had DJs that were not so receptive. Funny enough, a lot of those DJs aren't around so much and DJs are receptive are the ones that, you know, like to grow with the genres, you yeah. know, like Jeff Moyer, like Scaly Sarah. Um, and when it came to Medusa's, so I went out to Medusa's one night, which was really strange because at the time they didn't have goth nights. They didn't have industrial nights. There was nothing like that. It was mm. a it was a EDM, <laughs> you know, oh, and, I, yeah. and, and I did it because right. a friend was in. He was in the Navy. It was the holidays. And Dave spotted me. And he's like, hey, you're Suzanne's son, right? You go out to Neo a lot. Would you like to have a night here? And the rest is history. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> nice. And it didn't even start with me DJing there. I originally was just going to host it, do some wild dancing, you know, promote yeah. it to people. I was a big promoter for everyone at the time. And yeah, yeah. It, with the thing of like it being in the suburbs, having so many DJs go out for a night that was just growing was a little bit hard. And mm -hmm. since I already knew the music that people wanted to dance to, I'm like, you know what? I've, I've played instruments before. I know music theory. I can keep a beat. You know, let's, let's do this. So I teamed up with Joshua Cash and uh, DJ Instacash, and mm -hmm. we've been doing that night for, in February, 10 years. Damn. Yeah. I didn't know it was that long. That's Dropping amazing. the 10 bomb. <laughs> so so okay so 10 years well let me you know since we have this opportunity i would love to know and we're gonna i want to get into some of these some of the topics around this because they're so debated online but in for for dark wave for your experience in chicago how, do you feel like the music that gets played has evolved and changed over time or has it just kind of cycled or is it just the same stuff that's getting played? It's it's both. We mentioned I was a huge uh, nerd earlier, so if you imagine it's like you know, yeah. <laughs> if you imagine it's a uh, 
a laser beam rifle in a game and the longer that you hold down on the attack button the mm. you know more it charges and the mm-hmm. and the laser changes kind of like the old school arcade games uh back in the day when you go ahead and pick up an upgrade that's kind of what the music is like it goes around in cycles but every time that completes the cycle it evolves okay. and uh Interesting. and i really feel like a lot of classic goth is coming back but in an evolved form um there's yeah and and with these evolutions come you know more subgenres like there's a um and it, it's hard to say it's like what category does this belong to like um people had a t- hard time you know necessarily being like well is which house really goth or is it more you know this or that is power noise c- still considered mm. goth or is it you know more towards the industrial or what you know is it its own genre um there's a genre called wave which a lot of people are like that sounds more like street music or a little bit like hip-hop but it's got some really dark like overtones to it and stuff it's very mm. like dark ambient and it's like well it is another subgenre of like gothic music and that's awesome i think the more dark influence that different genres of music have the better hell i'd i'd love to hear some like old school you know music from like the 1920s to 1940s with like a dark twist on it i think that would be awesome mm. <laughs> i i think we already kind of have that actually a little bit voltaire is a little bit like that um maybe not as old but yeah. kind of definitely has like a little bit of jazzy swing to it, but you know, still some like dark spookiness added to it. And I, I love that. I love so that. like Twin Peaks, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Perfect. Yeah, totally. Have you do you get this issue with people only wanting to hear, I don't know, Dead Stars a million times, or only like you'll play something new and nobody dances, but then you put military fashion show on and uh, the dance floor is full again and you're just like why don't you people listen to new music you fucking assholes do you run so, do you run into that problem so that was uh that was the thing that i actually i battled with myself and i always do sometimes and i actually as i've gotten older the the me's inside have all come to agreement that we're on the same page <laughs> but between like uh the first like one to two years of me DJing, I was like, what is going on here? And then I was like, wait a minute, you need to think about this. And I always say from a dancer's point of view, mm-hmm. you can't think about it from a pure DJ's point of view. You have to think about it from a musician and a dancer's point of view is that one, those people are not going to be at as many events as you are going to be at, nor are they going to play any of those songs as many times mm-hmm. as you play them. Yeah. So maybe Dead Stars is a song yeah. that they only hear once a month. Maybe. Um, also, another thing is, if you play a new song and people love it, they might not dance to it because they've never heard it before and they're listening sure. to it and they're taking a moment to take that in. So a nice way to do it is to kind of you know judge your crowd, look at your crowd. I play event host a lot. I'm always going around. I try to say hi to everyone mm-hmm. at yeah. least and once in the night. Yeah. I try my best, but also, I also see, you know, how much people are dancing and I know, you know, while we're out, we want to drink some water. We want to have a little bit of some spirits for our cup and Mm -hmm. you can't dance five songs in a row. So when you think that your crowd's getting a little bit tired, go ahead, pop on something else. Let them listen to it while they get a drink. Hell, it might energize them for the next song. And then military fashion show is going to have twice (laughs) as many people out there as it usually does. (laughs) And then next month, that other song is going to replace military fashion. Show. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Now, all right. So, and this is this is an interesting question because I, I see this mostly come up in online communities, whether that's YouTube or Facebook groups or whatever. Not not exclusively though, but this idea of uh, the scene being dead, and it you you kind of take it from two different perspectives, which is why I think you'll have a really good perspective on this from within you know being going to so many events for so long i think i remember specifically about five or six years ago i was hearing a lot of oh the scene in chicago is dead or it's dying or it's on the way out or nobody goes out anymore and then i feel like it kind of came back and then maybe it's doing that a little bit again 
do you feel you know every time this happens people are like well this is it nobody wants to go to the clubs it's millennials it's the internet it's uh, nobody has money um nobody cares about in person interaction or whatever what's your what's your kind of take on that there's a lot of mixed truths to that um yeah and what and what i mean by that is a lot of those points have facts within them but are not whole facts by themselves um another thing is that yet again it's evolving it's changing um just like with the vinyl era going more towards the cds and now the digital era which is a complete mm-hmm. you know immersion of just your mp3s your wave files all that kinds of stuff um it is changing but it is not dead perhaps if you look at it from one point of view the things that you once felt were more prevalent are now dying out but only if you look in certain areas take physical promotion for mm-hmm. um yeah for yeah. a good example yeah. um i do a lot of digital promotion but you would be surprised how much physical promotion can go out there and get some of the people that might be a little bit more socially awkward or intimidated or not quite sure what you're trying to sell them. I mean, the same thing can go for, you know, online interactions. And that's why it's really a big thing for people that promote people that DJ to interact with the people that are going to these things or the people that, you know, have interest within the club night. I go ahead and I put up an event and the night of, I look at everyone that has interested or going, and this is crazy, but I really try to (laughs) remember the faces of the people that I do not have on my friends list, and I Mm -hmm. make it a point to go up to them and introduce them to the night, how we do things, you know, welcome them in. This might be the first scene night that they've ever gone to. I feel like the digital era really helps people reach out, but it's up to people to use these devices to reach other yeah. people yeah. yeah um i i feel that digital djing is a very interesting thing doing live things on um twitch youtube facebook all these type of things but nothing in this goes for anything this goes for digital interactions this goes for a little bit more lewd actions. Nothing's going to beat physical interaction when it comes Mm -hmm. to wanting to go out and dance and get in a group. Now, if you feel safe in the group, if that night is providing you what you want, that comes down to the night. So if some things are dying out, maybe they're just not doing what they need to do to keep the big crowd. Back in Mm -hmm. the day, people didn't have a lot of outlets to go socialize. You'd be at home bored Maybe watching basic television, or probably if you're if you're doing the right thing, reading a book or working on a craft, you know. But I did a lot of masturbating, but that's that's a good thing too. Like I say, (laughs) more physical, more physical (laughs) interaction will always be. But uh, um, (laughs) the thing is, is that people need to like have a night to go out to. They they want it. That's why these nights are still thriving. If the scene was dead, these nights wouldn't be around. Um, I feel that the scene is always having people grow with it and also Mm -hmm. sometimes grow out of going all the time or move to a different place. You're going to have new blood. Um, So this is an interesting thing. And this is a little off topic, but it it gets back on. Um, I have a little brother and sister who... um, my little sister has a 10 year age gap and Mm -hmm. I have people on my friends list that are about two to three years younger than her. And I have people on my friends list who it's going to be another year or two before they can come out to a club. The reason why is in two years, that person is going to be well acquainted with who you are in your digital presence, what type Mm -hmm. of events you promote, what music you put up, and maybe they're like, oh, man, I cannot wait till I'm 21. When I'm 21, yeah. I'm going to go out and I'm going to rock this party at this event that I've been waiting two years to go to. I've heard all this music. I can't wait to dance to it. And that is probably the person that's going to come out for the next four to six years. 
Yeah. And then yeah. the next yeah. generation. Scary Lady Sarah has an 18 plus night. You know, there are probably people on her friends list that try to add her at like 17, 16. Now her friends list is uh is maxed out as far as I know. Yeah, it is. But yeah. There, you definitely, I guarantee you, she has followers within the early teens, you know, because yeah. they're like, oh, man, four more years and I can go out to Nocturna. Little baby bats. You got to promote to new blood, because if you feel like the scene is dying, then maybe you're being a little stagnant, you know, or maybe you're not yeah. looking for the new nights. Maybe you're not expressing, you know, interest within newer things. Maybe you just want to hear military fashion show. And that's the only song you want to hear. We're not playing that. All right. I'll play Steina and Steina, <laughs> but I'm not playing military fashion show. Yeah. <laughs> Even the swing version. I'm so sick of. Oh, uh, my God. Really oh my times. God. There's a swing version. Yeah. Tonight. It was like a B side on something. Jesus. Um, no, but I'm, I'm glad you said that because I, on one of, on the previous episode, somebody commented and said, "This is why the scene is dying because everyone on this episode was 29 and older, and it's only goth and industrial are just old people genres, and they're not relevant anymore." And I had a, I, I had this experience where I I do a goth event at uh, the Renaissance Fair every year, and I mm -hmm. ran into a few people who were 18. Uh, which was surprising and they were all like yeah we're we've been to nocturna i was and they were in the suburbs i was like oh have you heard of dark wave and they're like yeah but it's 21 and up i can't go yet and so i invited them over next weekend we're doing a game night and so i'm gonna have a bunch of people that make me feel real old hanging out <laughs> playing video games and and tabletop games and I'm going to have some like friends of mine from the scene come over as well, because that was how I was introduced to the scene was through someone who knew people. So I feel like you, it's really important to do that, to get, to give back. Otherwise you do end up with just uh, a bunch of people aging in, in the scene and, and becoming irrelevant to everyone else, which I don't think is happening. Some people say it's happening, but I don't see that so much. The same thing goes for fashion the same thing goes for music. Mm -hmm. The same thing goes for how we do things. It just needs to evolve. People need to open their mind. And also, when it comes to elitism, people mm -hmm. really need to watch that. Not only when it comes to music or you know all this kinds of stuff, but also how we treat this younger generation. You yeah. know, there's a lot of stuff. Oh, this baby bat. And I get it. Some people around the age of 21 for some reason we all have that asshole you know phase mm -hmm. yeah. we get yeah. it whatever <laughs> let them get it out of them and hopefully within a controlled environment around people that they already know that if they get shunned by them they're like oh fuck maybe i should be yeah. on my shit rather than just right. oh i'm gonna come in here and do whatever you know introduce them show them the ropes like show them some respect as well let them be the adults that they're gonna grow into and don't yeah. ruin the possibility of people coming out and keeping these events alive because that's another thing. If you go ahead and you shun these younger kids, they're not going to waste their time. They're going to think, oh, these older people, I'm just going to stay online. And yes, you are going to kill this scene that way. Um, yeah. It's better to show them that there's fun and, and see what music they want to hear. I guarantee you there's some music that uh, they're going to want to play. Like, uh, I'll tell you this, um, talking about music and subgenres. Um, it was back in 2011 uh, to 2012, I started really bringing some new retro wave uh, to a lot mm -hmm. of different scene yeah. nights. And people gave me a look like, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> and then these bands are selling out three to four years later, and I'm giving them a look like, yes, I'm damn crazy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and that's the thing. It's like, you don't know what's going to be big until it's big unless you keep an open mind to things and you know yeah. you really kind of well, follow I, it no yeah i was just gonna say i heard i was i the, the question about synth wave in here was because i heard uh dj talking about that saying that a lot of or specifically industrial bands uh were going more and more synth wave and there were more and more synth wave bands um, like Grendel was an example of that and like the rain within and whatever. Um, I don't know if you see synthwave becoming more of a thing in the clubs or if that was regional to them, but um, it, I think that kind of thing is important because you, and you know, going back to the elitist thing, it's not an issue of, for me, it's more an issue of being an asshole. Um, I think you can still say 
I think you could still make delineations between well, this is classically considered goth, and this is classically considered industrial, and this is more electronic. Of course. But it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean you can tell someone actually you can't hang out with us because you listen to these other things. That's a serious problem. I'm I'm not going to mention the DJ, but when I had a uh, regular night at Neo, I had a DJ come into a booth. And he's like, hey, can you play some music with some lyrics in it? As I looked at the (laughs) full dance floor of people just going wild to a Carpenter Brut song. And they were just going nuts. And he's like, what is this stuff even? And I'm like, wow. (laughs) You really, what do you want me to play Metropolis 2001? Like, I'll I'll just put it on, you know. (laughs) Like, honestly. Yeah, Electronic Saviors, put that on. (laughs) Yeah, there we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna put Kathy's song on it like yeah. one thirty in the morning when everyone's liquored up. I'm gonna play the beginning of it too. Uh, oh God! <laughs> Just play play Empires. Oh uh, no! Uh, Kathy's song was my like uh, mow the mow the lawn song when I was in high school. Yeah, seriously. Uh, <laughs> all right, so so last little little thing here. I was listening to uh, Dark Industrial Frequencies. There's a couple DJs on there from Texas, uh, DJ Dante and DJ Depraved. And they brought up the, something that was interesting that I don't see in Chicago, but I thought it might be prudent to ask your opinion anyway. And it was this idea that they feel like events have become co- more cosplay events rather than subcultural events because uh, a couple r- reasons they brought up were that most of the nights are themed and then what they see is a lot of people show up just to dress up and look pretty and then sit around and talk and nobody dances. And I guess dancing is the metric by which they gauge whether the night is successful. And, um, and that's it that nobody actually participates. they just want to show up and look good for a night and then leave. And it's not an actual community so much as it should be. I don't see that happening in Chicago, but I, th- I thought I, I would want to hear your take on that. See, I would have to see the crowd in Texas. Yeah. I would also have to hear what uh, Dante and Depraved are playing, mm-hmm. which if they're resident DJs, I have they are. Yeah. a lot of faith within them that they know what they're doing. And uh, I'm not going to try and come out and be like, oh, well, they're playing the wrong music because uh, <laughs> no, that's not what's going on. There's probably a big crowd of people that want to go out there and dress up and just rock it out and listen to some good music. And the thing is, here's a, here's a question. If you weren't playing the right music to have a, a scene night to where people dress up and they go through all that, you know, all that effort to get done up for that night to go out there and then sit by the bar and drink mm-hmm. and listen at music, you know, yeah. They're, they're, yeah. they're there for about six hours listening to music they could listen to at home. Some of that stuff is hard to dance in. You're in Texas, which means it's hot. And (laughs) also, that's a good sign. That means people are socializing. That means people are doing stuff. So, you know, whether people are dancing, whether people are there just to dress up, you know, it's one thing or another. And also, that's not a thing that is becoming a new thing. That has always been a thing. We had the Club Kid era. That was a big thing where people just dress up to dress up and to go to every yeah. club night, no matter what it was. They'd go to normie club nights and freak out people. They're like, what the fuck are all these club kids doing here? This is top 40s. We got Hathaway playing. Why is this kid with a fucking rhino- rhinoceros horn and <laughs> yeah. like quad stacks in here? Oh, man. You know, but, uh, yeah. you know, like, I think that that's a good sign. I don't think that people should worry about that affecting the dance nights. Yes, I feel like in Chicago, especially at the nights I've been to or the nights I DJ, we have a lot of people on the floor. But also, Mm. this goes back to the whole thing of the synth wave. Do I see that becoming more prevalent? I see that just mixing itself in as it should. Like, Mm. there was a lot of bands, and there were actually more metal bands that did the synth wave. Then Grendel did it, and we had more of the industrial bands do that. Yeah, You're going to have these kids that are doing more classical goth, you know, ensembles. You're going to have more cyber goth ensembles and stuff like that. And they'll dance if they want to. And if they're not dancing, they still did it. They still came out. They're still having a good time. There's nothing to worry about, in my personal opinion. And honestly, some of that stuff dancing in it is rough. 
Like dancing yeah. in stacks is hard enough. Some of the outfits <laughs> I see, I'm like, I, I don't even know how he's moving. Like, <laughs> how do you get up the stairs? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I want to see him on a cart pushed by people. That's what I want to see. <laughs> if this boy did this and the gothic, you know, stuff that went around it and the motive and everything, don't we all sort of want to know that could be our teenager. That could be our kid doing that. How, how could that possibly happen? Being described as being involved with the goth movement, but uh, what exactly is that? We kind of know it when we see it, but uh, <laughs> some aspects of a goth lifestyle provoke. Could they provoke such a murder? Well, this article is titled, The MySpace Era Bands Keep the, Keeping the Internet's Weirdest Music Genre Alive. So... Yeah, like I said, I'm going to I'm going to skip over a lot of this because it's not as relevant. I want to get to the interesting parts. Before we before we get to the big chunk of it though, I'm interested in hearing your take on this because for me with Witch House specifically, I can't really dissociate that from new goth. Uh my I have a vivid memory of going on a walk with my wife in around I think it was early 2011. And I was scrolling through my Facebook feed and I came across a post about Witch House and New Goth. And I was just thought, what the fuck is New Goth? Why do they spell it wrong? What is happening? What is what is this nonsense? <laughs> and and made me think of new metal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I don't I mean, maybe maybe Witch House has grown beyond that now. But in my mind, I always associate those two things is that is that the case i know you've done a few witch house and new goth nights is it am i getting that wrong no i'd say you're right with that i'd i'd, I'd say you're right with that and i'd also i feel like so people are like myspace is keeping it alive i feel like soundcloud is keeping it alive to mm -hmm. be honest i feel like soundcloud is one of the best music platforms out there for keeping different subgenres alive and letting new artists actually come to life. Bandcamp is really great as well. Um yeah, I love Bandcamp. YouTube is SoundCloud somehow is too SoundCloud's too uh a young cool person for me. I don't I don't understand I don't understand what the the SoundCloud nonsense is, but they always try to make me download the app every time I go yeah. on SoundCloud. See, I'm a, I'm a big uh I'm a big desktop user and I only use it on my uh, mobile device if I'm actually at the gym. Um, mm -hmm. I'll usually go ahead and follow the band to their band camp and get their music if it's good. Yeah. But SoundCloud's a good way to go over it and everything like that. Um, I didn't get into SoundCloud at first, and then I just got crazy with it. So I totally understand that, where you're coming from on that. And, uh, you know, surprisingly enough, YouTube's been good. It's weird that MySpace is even considered a place to find music. And it's really funny because I thought about actually making myself a DJ Alpha Omega profile on MySpace <laughs> because I really wanted to be uncool cool, yeah, um, especially yeah. for my like, you know, YouTube and Twitch and be like, hey, kids, you can follow me on MySpace. It's kind of a new thing <laughs> in case you didn't know. You can also view it on your Helio phone, MySpace's phone. Do you remember oh that? The Helio phone, the little yeah. flame? Yeah. I had upload your pictures until you just yeah <laughs> yeah I'm getting one of those actually I'm looking at one on eBay I'm gonna pick up one of those get a SIM card pop that baby in I'm like look I'm uploading my pictures and song onto MySpace directly. <laughs> Have you seen that tweet? Uh, it went around as a meme where someone had posted. Oh, I wish Twitter would let you um, set up music so that when someone goes to their profile, it just starts playing your favorite music. And someone replied that we've now hit a generation that doesn't understand what MySpace is. <laughs> exactly. And and talking about things repeating themselves or things changing, I have a feeling that the MySpace era is actually coming back, especially with yeah. the way that platforms like YouTube and Facebook are going and just the way that certain things are happening within the world, like I, I this is completely ridiculous I, to even mention this, but the whole thing that's happening with the copyright stuff and memes right now. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, in the well, UK and the EU, yeah, yeah. So a place that people can be creative and just dump everything that's not Reddit because Reddit's too hard for people to understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I. It's, I'm starting to understand how my parents must have felt, I think, at this point in my life. <laughs> All right. So so let me read a little portion of this, and then I want to get into um, some discussion about Witch House and New Goth. So here, here's a quote. 
Uh, they say, I really don't know if Witch House has ever really was ever really alive, honestly. Uh, Brian, one third of White Ring, admits it seems like it's always been in a perpetual adolescence when it came out 10 years ago. It uh, it's kind of stuck there now. According to Vulture, Witch House music was birthed during the late 2000s and early 2010s during the end of the MySpace era, but the genre's deep, dark electro wave sound and the occult imagery in its lyrics, fashion, and music videos have continued to draw fans in well past its prime. Early Witch House artists typically produced spooky tracks that sampled from the 90s and 2000s horror films and hip-hop records. They layered these samples with heavy bass riffs, lots of synth, and sometimes vocals. Visually and aesthetically, people in the community reflected this dark music by incorporating magic symbols, upside-down crosses, and pentagrams into all-black hip-hop clothing. All right, so let's talk about this. I, I guess, well, well, let's start. I, I got a bunch of things to talk about here, but let's start with that kind of, that last bit of it, I guess, since that was the last thing I read. The, this issue of pagan symbology, and I, I'd be interested to hear both of your takes on this. Um, the way that I had seen it, was it seems like a lot of it got used just to give this air of mystery and weirdness, which I, I, I guess you could technically classify that as appropriation, but I haven't seen much in the way of anyone being upset about it or complaining about it. I mean, I know goths use a lot of religious symbology out of context, like a lot of it's Catholic symbology. Yeah, goths were, goths were doing that all yeah. over like the 90s mm -hmm. and, you know, I, and that's what I don't I was, think it's anything new. That, well, that's what I was trying to think about is, yeah, on, well, onks are different. Yeah, with the Catholic symbology, I think people generally kind of view Catholicism as already like appropriative and, and imperialist anyway, so they don't care. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. It was just always interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm basically an atheist. So it's I try to be sensitive towards the idea that using stuff out of context that other people hold as sacred or spiritual could be offensive but i guess i'm just surprised that more people weren't upset about i'm just going to use your religious symbol because i think it's, it's spooky <laughs> <laughs> my religious symbol is not an aesthetic <laughs> yeah yeah although now i think it's more like triangles and like oh yeah it's a lot of that but that's that's wingdings or whatever <laughs> It's all just aesthetic hoo-ha. It's like, ooh, this is spooky. I'm, fu I'm like, surprised if I actually see a, a proper satanic cross. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like, okay, so here's the thing about that. One, Witch House is in the same boat that Vaporwave is. Is that, one, there's a lot of different qualities to the sound. There's a lot of easy ways to make the music so you have a lot more artists that are out there mm -hmm. just making it because a lot of things can classify as vaporwave or witch house mm -hmm. and then the the third thing that kind of hurts and promotes them is the symbols it appeals to a niche little group yeah. that are looking for that but it mm -hmm. really is hard to look for for anybody else, because, you know, you're not going to go look for those symbols. And even if you do, sometimes it's not going to come up in a search. So you better know exactly mm -hmm. what you're looking for yeah, or else yeah. you're not going to find it. Yeah. Know which O's are lowercase and which O's are uppercase. So you can spell the band, band name out. Yeah. Or like, what was this band? Grill Grill. But it's like capitals with upside down l's and crosses and it's like how, yeah who, who the, <laughs> i guess it, i guess you kind of have to go there in the age of the internet because i know some people complain about this idea that goth isn't mysterious anymore because you have such access to stuff so you i guess you have to be purposefully obtuse with everything in order to create this mystique and bring back the kind of mystery to it i mean that that does bring up an interesting point. I mean, I guess even back in the day, if you were looking for those CDs at a store like an Empire Records, mm. you go up to the machine and you, I don't know what symbol that is. If you're looking for Grill Grill, <laughs> you're not going to find that CD in the in the Empire Records. You're going to have to look through the entire thing. And I know I'm dating myself by saying Empire Records. Like <laughs> this is a this is a thing. <laughs> the old Tower Records and all that fun stuff. Yeah, but um. Yeah. So what I want to, I, I, 
and Mark and Mark, I, well, let me ask you first before before I get to Jean Luc. But the sort of yeah. now that we're ten years on in since Witch House and New Goth has been out, all the yeah. all the complaining about the genre and the music and it being associated with goth culture. What is it? What do you think the main drive behind that was? Is it like they mentioned the hip hop samples that goths felt didn't fit, or was it some other sound or, or the look? Or what do you what do you think was the main issue? Um, well, I I think it's just the fact that it's a different genre or different subgenre, and uh, a lot of goths just aren't ready for it because it's. It's different. Mm. Um, That's I, now, I I do think that a lot of the hip hop elements were a big turn off. I mean, you know, I got nothing against hip hop music. I respect it, but it's not for me. And you know, some some of the witch house bands that are more associated, you know, that lean more hip hop, uh, I personally don't really care for. But there are others that I think are just fucking great. Yeah. So, you know, it's Witch House has always been just hit or miss for me. Uh, and see, I and for my Jean-Luc, I'll ask you in a second. For me, with the hip hop stuff, I personally, I love hip hop. Um, I don't listen to it very often, but when I hear good hip hop, I totally love it. But I think the the problem is if you if you start saying, well, this this genre of hip hop is pretty dark. So let's just say it's associated with goth culture. I think you're doing a disservice both to hip hop and to goth. And I don't think there's anything wrong with saying these are, these have their own cultural lineages. Um, but I don't, uh, first I'll get into what I think about it in a second, but I, I don't necessarily think, I think the hip hop was only a small part of it. But Jean-Luc, when it comes to like the association between industrial or goth with witch house, how do you see that kind of playing out in the, the did you see resistance to that and and why do you think that was so there's a lot of interesting things to say about that so we go back and he says 10 years well what's happened in 10 years 2008 we still have a lot of people that are buying cds and stuff like that well if you're looking for goth music and you're looking to buy a cd you go in there and you're specifically looking for something in that genre. You're not going to pick up a Witch House CD. However, if you're somebody in 2018 that's doing a search for music and you are someone who's into goth and enjoys hip hop as well or just likes a little bit of variety and you find this song that you can digitally buy, this album that you're totally into and it's a Witch House album, I feel like Witch House is about to become the adult that it needs to become among its you know musical peers like he was talking about it you know always being within its adolescence well i think it's about to grow up now because there's more people that have access to it and for more reasons um when you went into a store and you were looking for a specific genre you weren't trying to really mix it up and if you were listening to things you probably weren't going to spend the 15 20 10 dollars to get that cd now you can particularly buy, you know, whatever little song you want. Maybe you like two or three tracks off of an album, but you hate the rest of it because the rest of it just isn't for you. But you're like, damn, I really mm -hmm. like those two songs. You can do that now, which then spreads the music out more. Um, I feel that it definitely wasn't accepted within the goth and industrial crowd for a while. I feel like a lot of people thought it was a joke almost or like, oh, yeah, yeah. you know. Somebody's just sitting at home and, you know, putting whatever in. And some songs were a little bit more distorted than others. But then again, I feel like it was the beginning of power noise music as well. I mean, there's a lot of people in the industrial scene that didn't accept that as like industrial fueled music. And, you know, you see where that is now. Mm -hmm. um, that's the same thing with a lot of like synthwave tracks that have become more integrated into the goth scene you know music scene especially within club nights and stuff you know it's yeah. not just classical goth music anymore there's a lot more variety to it so yeah. when you have something like witch house it's kind of grown into itself now and it's it's well, also refined yeah. itself 
when you mentioned that you felt like it was about to grow up, I think that maybe, maybe is actually going to do a disservice because the way that I viewed it when it when it first came about and it was it ended up at least from what I was seeing online getting conflated with a lot of these other uh, fashion groups and uh, the the term I used was neo tribal identities, which basically was this idea that there are all these gr- subcultural groups or groups of individuals that are linked together either from an aesthetic or a sound. And rather than being kind of clearly defined or loosely defined and and um, people grow up and through them, they became this thing where individuals would move from one group to another without any real attachment or long-term commitment. And that the, the nature of that um, ephemeral space for youth was had this kind of entrepreneurial aspect to it that uh, because these different groups were blurring into one and ch- one another and they were uh, porous and they shared me- uh, members um, that that was where the kind of subcultural or uh, uh, subversive power came from because it was subverting the traditional um, subcultural uh, uh, model, I guess. So whether it was a style tribe or music like Witch House that was, like you were saying, really wide ranging and was able to incorporate a lot of different things without being easily pinned down, um, that that was what made it interesting. But on the other end of that, it also kind of, I feel like, was the downfall because, well, first of all, I don't think anything like any music sound any any genre like that can survive without classification for very long once it becomes known and it becomes readable and definable it's going to eventually happen and because i feel like because there was a a lack of depth with those types of things like take new goth for example a lot of that style i think has been kind of what would be the word commodified by like the kill stars and those types of uh, fashion outlets and kind of absorbed into general alternative aesthetic and the kind of trend trendy thing rather than being this transgressive um, fluid dynamic sort of environment. And that now that, you know, if, if which house is going to become more, now that it's older, uh, become more definable that maybe there's not enough depth of culture there to give it the kind of meaning that something like goth would have over time. I could see that happening. If that makes sense. Kind of, I could, kind of remains to be seen though, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, I think part of, partly we have seen that, especially with, because when I remember when the new goth style came out and pastel goth has kind of disappeared. There's still a few people that do it, but it's not really a thing anymore. With new goth, I feel like that aesthetic was, well, there were two reactions. It was like, hey, goths are already kind of doing that. That's just like casual goth. And then there was the, um, oh, this is just a mishmash of garbage reaction. But what happened, I think, was that style became definable and as such s- companies started marketing it and uh it it sort of became absorbed into the kill stars of the world so i feel like we've kind of seen that already happen with new goth and and witch house in general i don't think is really too much of a thing anymore or if it is it's it's well, different well i i know there's a club uh I know, like, there's a club a few hours away from me, mm-hmm. but I know they do play Witch House, and they also play a lot of, you know, Dark Wave, Industrial. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of just a, a mix, but Witch House is uh, definitely in there. Hmm. Any thoughts on any of that, Jean-Luc? <laughs> yeah, so I feel like Witch House can definitely split off. I don't feel like it will all go in one direction where it will just become a thing that's you know mainstream and mass merchandise within its own self i don't think you're going to see a lot of Mm -hmm. like the aesthetic symbols and a hot topic and everything like that but that's actually a a good point as well is that um just like with classic goth music 
some stuff could be considered mainstream. I'm like, what is mainstream? Is it when something's sold on a shelf? When it's easy mm. to, you know, have access to? Is it mainstream when everyone's doing it or when everyone can do it? What mm-hmm. makes something mainstream? Um, I have a few opinions on it myself, um, but I feel that that's kind of a thing that is, you know, it's it's a big opinion thing. It, it really yeah. depends on how people feel about it. Yeah. Um, I do know that there's mm-hmm. nights, including some that I've done and some that I do, that incorporate witch house into it or are around witch house i feel like a witch house vaporwave and other genres are kind of going to find a niche group that want to hear all of them um the pastel goth i feel like could also be found within that and i feel like there's gonna be always like a you know a culture that is going to follow these music genres wherever they go and they're they're gonna want these musicians to perform live even if it's just to a room of like 15 and 20 people those 15 20 Mm. people were gonna be willing to spend anything to have that person there live um music is so wild these days because you know like we were saying earlier anybody can do it and also yeah touching on one more point um so a lot of people look at witch house the way that they used to look at industrial And, uh, you know, one of the most notable people in the uh, in the early days of industrial music uh, that really became mainstream was Trent Reznor. And, you know, his sound was so different from a lot of things that were out in that era that a lot of people a lot of people were like, oh, yeah, you know, that goth guy or, oh, you know, (laughs) that 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 that, (laughs) he's metal, right? Nobody, nobody, <laughs> nobody understood what he was, you know, until he, you know, made his own path. And then he became, to a lot of people, mainstream. There was a while where he was the, oh, this is, this is like underground music. This is like mm-hmm. scene music. And then there was like, oh, you listen to Nine Inch Nails? That's mainstream. That's mainstream industrial. That's mainstream goth industrial. Come on, get out of here. You know, type of thing. I'm just so pissed that I... uh I'm unable to go see Nine Inch Nails because they wouldn't sell their tickets online. So, talk about an old school way of doing things. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Oh uh, well, I'm, I see. I'm not a local, so I would have to drive like for several hours in order to wait in line at a ticket booth and uh, pick up the tickets physically, which I just I couldn't do because of time constraints and you know what have you. That's but. so crazy, though. That they would not sell that online. Yeah. What are you? What is that even? Uh, it's they. I think it was a move to uh, prevent like scalpers from fucking people over. Wow. Now that's that's interesting. I I kind of like that. I I kind of like that. But then again, I'm kind of like, you know, you should let these people buy one ticket, one ticket online. Yeah. What are you doing here? Yeah, so I have I have one last question before we uh, close out this article here, and it's something that was brought up on the last episode that I didn't I didn't really touch it because I didn't feel like it was appropriate to go off on that tangent for what we were talking about. But um, Alex Reed was on that episode, um, author of Assimilate, and he he brought up this idea that he f- he felt like um, the reason there was such a backlash to New Goth and Witch House was because that scene was um like incredibly sexually fluid and empowering and goths felt like they were being one upped by a i guess a younger um more gender fluid forward thinking community and that was <laughs> that was something i had never even considered before i had never thought of it in those terms i don't know if that's something that has ever come up for either of you or if you have thoughts on that, it, but it came kind of came out of left field for me. Was he referring to the music or the, like I think the the, the new scene? the new goth scene? Yeah. Oh. That see, I I've honestly I've never even seen a a new goth in person. <laughs> like I've never gone to a goth club and said, "Wow, that person is really new mm. goth." Like it just never happened. 
where I live, at least. I mean, you're talking to a guy who's been a uh, master at a dungeon before and gone to plenty of dungeon parties. I'm not really worried about anybody coming out and flaunting whatever sexuality or anything that they, or sexual personification or whatever this, you know, yeah. this, um, this worry is. Like, I, I, don't, I don't see that as a thing. It's like, wait, I thought this was always a thing. Like, isn't, isn't the entire idea of like, the goth community, like, you know, Dracula himself, like, isn't he a mm-hmm. seductful creature? Aren't vampires seducing creatures? And most of the um, mythos within gothic culture, like, you know, I, I I feel that it has its own sexual nature to it. I, I don't think that there's anything that's being added to it. Maybe it's just a little bit more visual nowadays because this is a digital era. But besides that, yeah, I, I don't see a big difference. I never really made that association either, so I don't. I just I don't know. I wanted to bring it up to to both of you just to see if you had thought of it because for me I never associated that as an issue. My issue was always more that they were kind of taking the stuff that goth had developed for so long and using it in more of a flippant or not flippant but just using it for, you know, taking the credit for all our hard work. <laughs> Uh, and not giving us, you know, trying to change what goth was or trying to break it off into something it wasn't. Um, I think that was more where the complaints came from. I don't know if that was necessarily the intent of those bands. I don't I don't think they were really being flippant. I think they were pretty sincere. Yeah. Like I or maybe it's just how I interpret the witch house that I do like. It comes off as very earnest and sincere. Mm-hmm. And not just, you know, goofy or dumb. And they're, I, like I said, this is the witch house that I like. Yeah. There, there's some that I don't like, but, you know. Well, and part of it was, there was this quote uh, farther down here. What do they say? There were, there were two parts here that also brought up an issue I had. This one quote was, um, I think... I think of it as having a punk spirit where everything is always a fuck you. Uh, it's like, I'm going to release a song, but I'm going to do it in this weird way. And then there was this other quote, I'm trying to find it. Uh, I think witch house has amazing value as being one of the first generations of music born from the internet before then you didn't have any dark or ambient music. So it was a really good balance for internet music genres like chill wave and vaporwave that had mainstream appeal. And both of those just. Well, like there wasn't any before that there wasn't any dark or spooky music like what? Because it, 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 that was the other complaint is that like there there's no if it's going to be associated with goth, there's no understanding of the history of goth because like it, whether you want to go with more a more industrial thing like Lust Mord or you want to bring up Dead Can Dance or Soap or Eternus or something, um, dark or ambient music has been a thing and maybe just. Maybe maybe for that group with Witch House, maybe they just never associated any of it with goth culture or that was never the case. But because for me, new goth was directly tied to it and it has goth in the name, that type of thing um, right. just kind of bugged me that like you're just ignoring the entire history of what that word means. See, the thing is, I feel like Witch House itself is like unaware of its presence within, you know, mm. the music genres. And I feel like your point about it coming in there with the age of the internet, with Vaporwave and kind of fitting itself in there is kind of like a touchback at what I said about, you know, those niche groups that are really into it because it's really the self driven artists. Like, you don't need a band to make witch house you need mm-hmm. a laptop to make witch house you need um some inspiration to make it and maybe you're not really into the goth scene at all so you don't see that you know you're just like oh mm-hmm. well, i really like these dark you know rusty sounds i like you know putting all these like weird ambient noises together and making some stuff and then there's some people out there that really are doing it but they they don't they don't put the roots in uh in goth music and I, I i have seen that but i don't know if that's out of uh disrespect or anything um i think it's just uh 
kind of a, a standing on their own two feet and feeling as though they've, they've found something that's a nice in between. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think you're probably right. I'm looking to I'm just looking to finish off this article. There's the the quote at the very end um says that uh, they were talking about how the witch house, witch house turned from hip hop to more electronic and um Lobo said that uh, I don't think it will ever get stuck. Hip hop and electronic music has been changing over the past 30 years. And which house's sound will continue to be influenced by those two styles of music? Audience-wise, it might get stuck, but it can it can get bigger still. It just needs some more time. And in in that quote, and I guess through the rest of the article, goth and industrial were never mentioned at all in relation to it. But it's still, you know, on a community level, uh, gets kind of associated with that. So there's some kind of weird disconnect there. I mean, for me, I th- when I think about the evolution of goth sound, I what I see right now is that m- more uh, dark wave post punk sound uh, as kind of carrying on the the evolution of goth music. A lot of a lot of those bands, um, like I don't know, Drab Majesty always gets brought up, but uh, Sixth June and and CeeLo Fan and all yeah. and all those kinds of bands. So I think w- the way I see it kind of happening is Witch House and New Goth came out and Goths were like, what is happening? Why is this a thing? Is this what people are trying to change Goth now? And then what ended up, it kind of ended up having that backlash that we saw with from Cyber Goth to um, the Death Rock revival where where we went from New Goth to this kind of like, okay, recognition that we need to we can't just keep listening to 80s goth rock. We have to do something. And so we ended up having this kind of mix between the post-punk sound and the dark wave sound as evolved through all of these new bands. And I think that's where we're at now as kind of a reaction to that. For goth specifically, I mean, industrial is probably a, di- a totally separate thing. I I think this is also... a a um a good thing to keep in mind when it comes to music or any type of art form in a way is that everything has a re- mm-hmm. be- a beginning and an end but that doesn't mean that it can't have a rebirth or it can't be m- a memory that is continually brought to the table you know there's music that has been passed down for centuries and mm-hmm. we go ahead and we put it together and we play it on new instruments on, and we record yeah. it on new technology, like songs mm-hmm. that were made in the 1700s that, you know, a violin piece or something like that. We're playing that on an electrical violin. We're recording that on a computer. That mm-hmm. is the way it is supposed to be played, but not the way it was ever meant to be played. Yeah. And that, you know, <laughs> for a while, that type of music was never played or as far as we know there's a lot of documented history and you get some sticky stuff when you when you go that far back in history when it comes to music but i feel like even goth itself will eventually go to a point where it doesn't die but it goes and it hibernates for a while and then somebody Mm -hmm. revitalizes it and i feel that within that time there's going to be a lot of genres you know which house included that Maybe, you know, we'll do the same thing or, you know, evolve a little bit more or just something along those lines. I I see this with a lot of genres. And even if you just take the last century, mm-hmm. I mean, nobody's doing the same music that they were doing back in the 1920s right now. But <laughs> we just had the retro wave era come back. And totally yeah. bring, you know, beats from the 80s. I mean, to follow that up, there's a lot of witch house music now compared to five, ten years ago that sounds more like an actual song. Something that you could hear at a club. Something that mm. people could dance to. That yeah. is only possible because mm. of the technology that we now have and the... um 
instruments and the way that we can create it. And that's intimidating to a lot of people too. So a lot of people don't mm-hmm. want to accept it. You know, a lot of people are like, oh no, it's this, it's that, or, oh, it's trying to do this and that when really it's just trying to grow. I don't think that it's like an intimidating thing of, oh, it's trying to replace this thing as, as much of it's trying to make its own. Yeah. Yeah. I think that plays into, I was actually going to bring this up next week, but I, it kind of is salient to this. What you you just said is I was talking with rise Fulber um, on Friday night and he brought up this notion that he, of how he hates the word scene um, which I'll go into more detail in this for the next episode. I don't want to drag it out now, but um, I, basically the place that was coming out of, I think was this idea that for him as a musician, once, once a scene forms or someone starts talking about a scene, it's immediately um, you have to stick within this box and um, everything outside of that is a threat. And um, I, I do feel like that is a problem. And we shouldn't be attacking other people for their trying to be artistically expressive, um, but that we should be either incorporating that or just saying, that's really cool. I can get into that as well kind of thing. That's very true. Uh, All right. Well, speaking of Retrowave, let's jump into the album review. Album review. Okay, so this month we are reviewing the album Crystal Cage by the band Crystal Cage. Uh, The only information I have on them are that they are a Finnish band and they describe their sound as gothic minimalism like the Cranes, black metal, bass mixing of early jungle and DB. Bootleg aesthetics and ARPs from 80s, 90s electronic pop techno Berlin school. So before we get into the review, I'm going to play a track and I am going to play Burning Crystalline.
gotta say, this band totally reminds me of what we've been getting the last half decade. And, you know, that is the band camp artist that has this type of electronic feel to them, but is minimalist goth and, you know, is just another thing to where people are like, is that goth? Is that new retrowave? What is it? What does it, yeah. you know, what does that fit within? It's like, well, that's what do you perceive goth to be? Is goth the sound, you know, of it? Or is it, you know, the aesthetic behind it? And by sound, I mean, what do you expect goth to be played on? Do you expect it all to sound like, you know, the 80s goth that you know, where it's just, you know, four people in a band, three people in a band on actual instruments? Or do you, mm-hmm. is this something that's, you know, programmed? Is this program music? Because both of them have a real different and unique sound but both of them can be the same genre um i felt like this kind of it it felt like it came out of like the mid 80s so it was Mm. kind of it was kind of interesting to hear it with instruments from today but it kind of really had that style of like three decades ago and i was like wow this is uh this is a nice little throwback here so i i mean I uh, I could not get into this. I'm sorry. I did I like ex- for an ex- extended period of time for the listening through the entire album a couple times. I just couldn't get into it. I I really enjoyed some tracks like uh, the one I just played and then Floating Mountains because they had more of that gothic dirge quality. Um, the kind of dragging, slow, mournful sound. Um, the track uh, Ativa had this uh, i thought it had like a pretty neat blade runner sound I, there were definitely 80s uh vibes to it i felt it was more mm, rather than authentic 80s it sounded more like the kind of uh idealized 80s stuff you'll mm-hmm. get yeah um which is fine like that's fine and I, that that was the the weird thing to me i don't, i couldn't understand why i couldn't get into it because I enjoyed the component parts. I like I enjoy the 80s um I don't know retro dome kind of stuff. I like the slowness of it and I like the drone kind of sounds. Um I enjoy the the sort of weird ethereal soundtrack parts of it. But when it was all put together for how many tracks was this? 10 10 tracks. Um I don't know, it just it just couldn't hold my attention. You know, I'm so. I I totally understand that because um, I was listening to it and I got this feeling after listening to so many songs in a row that they were kind of blending into each other. Mm, and yeah. I gotta I gotta say this to anybody, you know, DJs, dancers, musicians, don't be afraid to experiment and to push the limits. Sometimes you get noticed from one or two tracks in your album than the entire album. Nobody gives a shit about the entire album. They just give a shit about that one song. And that one song is so crazy because that one song is the one song that you decided to break the mold on. And mm. everyone's like, whoa, what is this? And none so, of your other songs sound like that. Do, do you think that is partially, you feel that way partially because you're a DJ? Because, I mean, obviously there's that debate of no, either nobody listens to albums anymore or people still listen to albums. So I I listen to albums for a lot. No, that's totally true for a lot of people. But I listen to full albums because there's music for cruising and being at home. There's music for mm. getting your health goth on. There's you know music for getting your mm. uh, your lewd goth on. There's <laughs> you know there's music for getting your you know your rock and goth on. There's just different music for different times. And what I mean by that is like I would have listened to that album. Had it had a little bit more, I don't, I don't want to be cruel, but a little bit more variety to it. I felt like out of ten songs, I got five, maybe four. Yeah. And uh, honestly, you know, I saw the rating scale. That's why, out of like, you know, a triple banana split Sunday with cherries on top, I'm gonna have it to give it like four Shirley Temples with, uh, <laughs> with cherries, but only toothpicks, not the plastic swords that you get. So between four what people, is happening? you can't have a pirate fight. <laughs> It's not going to happen. So if they work on that a little bit, maybe a little bit more, you know, a little bit more grinning than that. But uh, for now, okay, that's the way I'm feeling. I'm so confused. 
Uh, yeah, no, I, I. <laughs> So what was the rating? I, well, I think he just explained it. Obviously, keep yeah. up. Come on, man. That's uh, for Shirley. I would probably for me. Yeah, yeah, sure. Plastic swords. I don't know. Pirate. <laughs> it was talk like a pirate day the other day. So whatever. Uh, I'd probably for me, I would give it a two and a half out of five. So it yeah. was just middle of the road. Yeah, pretty. All would, right. Well, uh, let's close minutes. out the episode. Sure. Cool. Um. All right. Let's close out the episode with sinister suggestions. So you've got to be interested in death. It's the last great taboo. It's the only taboo left. Precisely. I mean, why is it, do you think, that everyone in here is dressed in black? It's a celebration of death. No, I just like the clothes. Mm. Yeah, well, no, I mean, <laughs> the clothes look good. Yeah, I mean, death looks good. Charles Manson, yeah? No, he was cool. Mm. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but I'm actually a vampire. <laughs> Sinister suggestions. So my suggestion is this YouTube series on BuzzFeed of all places um, called Unexplained Mysteries Supernatural. And I guess this has been a thing for a while and a couple memes have even come out of this. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Hey Demons, It's Me, Ya Boy meme. But um, it came from that. And it's basically, it's kind of like a ghost hunter series, but it's uh, one dude who believes in ghosts and one dude who, who is total skeptic, absolute nonplussed, nothing nothing scares him. He's, he's just like, oh, obviously that was the wind. Like, why are you crying in the corner kind of thing? And so the the combination of those together is makes for an absolute hilarious show i've been watching it in the background while i've been uh, working from home from my second job and it's uh it's really funny and it's really entertaining so if you're into ghost hunting shows or uh just comedy like something something to kind of just watch and take your mind off stuff and just feel good for a little while uh, i would definitely recommend that there's four seasons of it on youtube so far so i'll have a link to that in the show notes if you guys want to check it out great um, Mark, any any ideas? Anything you've been enjoying? Um, I actually do have wow. something, and you're probably gonna you're gonna fucking hate not, this. Not a video like, <laughs> game, then. Okay. No, it's it it's like it combines two things that you probably dislike: Crux Shadows and um, Crux Shadows. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, no. Okay. Close, but okay, no. Um, so like a weird thing it's not a weird thing about me a kind of kind of a nerdy thing about me is that i'm a big fan of independent professional wrestling mm -hmm. yep. and there there is a brand new wrestling promotion it is called black craft wrestling oh my and I'm god sure you, you've heard of black craft the I'm clothing sure. company yes, is this related create, to the clothing company it is from the same people who do the clothing what company the fuck? Okay. <laughs> yeah, they created their own fucking wrestling promotion and like it's so like I enjoy the wrestling but like I always wondered what it would be like. Okay, what if you could have like a gothy dark spooky type of oh, wrestling promotion and lo and behold it mm -hmm. exists. And apparently okay. Doug Bradley who is Pinhead from Hellraiser, uh, he is uh, like unaware. Yeah, he is like their main kind of like authority figure. So, so he's not actually wrestling because he would he probably doesn't, break. Sadly. Okay. Yeah, he would, he, his head would crack, but. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, a re it's just this really interesting All niche right. kind of wrestling promotion that I just got a big kick out of. Okay. Cool. I, is it? Is there anywhere I could watch that? Or th there's probably clips on YouTube, right? So I can get a yeah, feel there's for it. clips on YouTube. Okay. Um, yeah, but just like look at it because it's so weird and different, and just like ah. Okay, uh, Jean Luc, have you anything uh, you've been uh, enjoying games or books or anything you want to recommend? Oh, uh, there's quite a plethora of things I've been enjoying. Maybe a little bit too much, but uh. As far as music goes, um, I'm going to actually drop a name here, Volta. I definitely suggest everyone go check out their um, Bandcamp, Facebook, and SoundCloud. 
page because uh, they are a badass, hard-hitting new retro wave band that I think a lot of people will enjoy. And I'll probably be playing one of their songs at this next Medufa, Medusa's Dark Wave. Medupa Dark Wave? <laughs> Medusa's Dark Wave. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, I'm I'm watching this, and this is disturbing on a fundamental level of my psyche. I don't. I know it's great. <laughs> <laughs> what are you watching there? I'm not. I don't think Black Craft oh, Wrestling. Okay. I'm. I'm not. I. This is the. There's like Gothic cathedral lanterns hanging, and this guy's got a satanic uh, cross on his. Well, I. This. I mean, is Japan probably loves that. I've ever seen. I know. It's like you. You've got to be like into it to like really understand. It's, <laughs> the, it's I know they call it a cult, but it's like it's literally like a cult. Like you have to <laughs> just kind of okay. From okay. the outside, it's like fucking weird, but like once you're into it, mm. you're into it. Mm-hmm. I think that's the only time I've ever mm-hmm. heard a cult defended in that way. I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Heaven's right, Gate so, is the shit. So, <laughs> so before we go. Um, and obviously I'll have links to this in the show notes. If you guys are listening on YouTube, it will be in the notes under the video. If you're on a podcast app, just swipe left or right and you'll have links to everything there. But John Luke, can you let are you us... going to link Blackcraft Wrestling? I will have to our, now. Yeah. Our fucking page. Thanks. Thanks for that. <laughs> Permanently on the uh... Belfry Network forever because of you. Jean-Luc, let us know where would be a good place for people to find either you or, you know, your events uh, and stuff you want to promote online. They can find me on Twitch where I'll be live streaming future events where they can get a bird's eye view of what goes down in the club. You're going to be live streaming Dark Wave? Yes, we live streamed Dark Wave last month. And the great thing is, is that club lighting assures that nobody's seen. It's just the silhouettes of the people at the club. So you see the lights, you see the silhouettes, you get to see the DJs. The DJs are well lit up and the bar area is well lit up. But nobody has to worry about having their face on there. So nobody has to worry about, you know, being like, hey, I'm antisocial enough. I came out here to have fun, not get on camera, you know, but you get to see the night. So if you want to see what's going on, if you want to hear the music, there's also interactions. People can put requests through there. So Twitch. Um, that is an amazing idea. I can't believe I missed that. Is that on your personal Twitch? That's on my personal Twitch. Holy shit. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually going to be that's editing awesome. some of the footage um, this week and next weekend and then uploading small little clips to uh, help promote the next Dark Wave. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they can find me on Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram at DJ Alpha Omega. They can find me on Facebook at John Lucas or, you know, look up Post Apocalyptic Productions, all that kinds of fun jazz. I'll pop up on TV one day. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody watch TV anymore? Like, I. Is is that a thing? Uh, I watch no. YouTube on my television. Okay, yeah, yeah watch I use YouTube, it to stream, like Netflix and stuff. But I'm talking like TV. Is that even no. like a thing? That's a bar thing. <laughs> yeah, well, it's an old people yeah. thing. <laughs> it's an yeah. old people thing. Yeah. Well, we're getting we're getting there, Mark. You're closer than I am. Yeah. So I listen to radio shows only by like a year. God. Are you, are you like 32? Close enough. I'm 31, but uh, yeah, two oh, years. Okay. Whatever. I thought you were like in your 20s still. No. Hey. No. I wish. Looking <laughs> good there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for hanging out. I, I really appreciate you taking the time, and this was a lot of fun. Thanks for coming on again. Hey, thanks for having me on. This was great. Jean-Luc, thank you again so much for hanging out, hanging out with us this month. I want to close the show out with a retraction uh, of sorts, a correction from a previous episode, the Cemetery Rejections episode, where we talked about upper-class goth at sort of the intro of the show. It wasn't something I was really prepared to talk about for the podcast episode. It just sort of came up in conversation and uh, we ran with it. I received a number of corrections on the YouTube comments for that episode, and I very much appreciate that. Uh, The gist of it is, when I brought it up, I mentioned that uh, Simon and Adora Batbrat, Simon being Cole Candy, 
were using the hashtag upper class goth on Instagram, although it looks like that was actually not the case. It seems to have been originated by Victoria Lovelace, and she's the uh, main Instagram goth or alternative person that uses it. A number of clothing brands and, and websites have now taken that hashtag and used it on Instagram. I guess the backstory that I was getting from the comments was that in around 2014, someone had called Adora a uh, upper class goth and Victoria Lovelace as well. And that I think is, I think that's where my confusion came in from. And what ha- ended up happening was it was used as an insult to try and bully them about their style and uh, how they dress. And so uh, Victoria Lovelace started using the hashtag and Adora may have used it early on as well to kind of take control of the term and flip it around and use it uh, for their own to make it a positive thing, I guess. Again, though, a lot of my complaints about the the term itself, the hashtag itself still stand. I mean, that was almost five years ago and the context of it has basically been lost. It may be one of these things, I think, where uh, it's just such a, a minor thing that exists on the internet that doesn't get a lot of attention and um, somebody eventually found it started posting about it in facebook groups and that kind of spread to reddit and wherever else it was going to go youtube videos that kind of thing and uh was brought to the attention of a wider audience and i i think that does kind of speak to the fact that these types of instagram models victoria lovelace adora bat brat aren't really revolving through goth circles there they end up the the people who follow them do really end up being tangential uh and that stuff just kind of ends up bleeding into the goth culture um sort of cultural zeitgeist and 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 groups and that kind of thing uh over time because as it gets noticed online so i don't i don't really want to make too big of a deal of it it had its time it had its moment um, I'm ready to move on. I, uh, I've said what I needed to say. I just wanted to make that quick correction. And I would like to thank everyone who comments on the YouTube videos. We've had a lot of positive comments. The most recent episode on misogyny and toxic masculinity, we did get some trolls. We did get some hateful rhetoric on the YouTube channel and that stuff gets deleted. Uh, it'll get responded to occasionally, but, um, once I see it, it's gone. I don't have time for that. Largely, though, the comments for that episode were very positive, very constructive. There were some people who um, did have some disagreements and were able to voice those in a constructive and meaningful way, uh, which was very much appreciative. Next week, or uh, two weeks from now, we will be back with an interview with Andy Dean. I believe I mentioned on a previous episode, or on the misogyny episode, that Uh, We were going to be doing the political episode, and I actually had my dates mixed up. Uh, That is going to be the end of next month. So that will, however, still be a panel discussion. I will be having on guests from across the spectrum who have some different views on both, both politically and socially and on whether or not goth should take a stance on politics and to what degree goths should be aligned with political ideologies. So that will be coming, but next week we're going to be hanging out with Andy Dean, talking about his time in Bella Morte, but more importantly talking about his current projects and his interesting take on the goth scene. He's one of those people who is, I would almost say, hyper-inclusive to the point where Um, he said in the past that goth is whatever you want to call it. If you want to say you're a goth, then you're a goth. And there's no real criteria or uh, way to determine what is and is not goth. So I'm very interested to sit down and talk with him. I know he's he's a big goofball and he's a fun guy and um, I enjoy his work. So I think that's going to be an interesting interview as we drill down to the sort of minutia and undergirding philosophy of how we define culture and what the human cost and the um, process of treating others with respect and respecting others' wishes has to do with both the way we define culture and the perspective that musicians have as they get kind of pigeonholed into genres and into scenes and are expected to 
behave and define themselves and their music in certain ways and how that can impact their perspective on uh, cultural movements. If you enjoy the show and you want to help support us, help keep us online, uh, allow us the stability and safety to create the show and produce more episodes, and you would like to get some bonus content, I know I talked about that in the intro to the show, head over to patreon.com slash cemetery confessions. You can see right there on the side. Uh, what kind of rewards you'll get for what level, but at just $1 a month, you'll be able to get some bonus content and you'll know that you are supporting us, supporting the show and supporting goth culture as a whole. And this kind of the dialectical nature of goth culture that I think is so, so important. Thank you again for spending your time with us. It's always a pleasure until next time. Stay dark. The preceding program is a member of The Belfry, a network of blogs, podcasts, and videos for the darkly inclined. Go to thebelfry.rip for more information.